Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a historical treasure. The extent to which you think it's a treasure will depend on your personal judgment and taste and acumen and psychosis, all of those things combined. I'm speaking of the wonderful eloquence release of Erich Kleiber, good old Erich Kleiber, the Papa of Carlos, the complete Polydor 78. Now, these were all recorded between 1926 and 1929. They're electrical recordings, not acoustic recordings, which is a good thing. But the question is, just how do they stack up? And I really want to use this particular set as a sort of exemplar of, of the difficulty professionally and historically and, and you know, aesthetically and, and in trying to evaluate historical recordings generally, because there are people who live for historical recordings. That's a cult. There is the cult of historical recordings. And like most cults, I can't be bothered with it because talking to those people is like talking to any group of true believers. They don't care what anyone has to say. They like what they like because they like it and you can't talk them out of it. And there's no reason you'd want to. And they can go on and listen to the same thing over and over and over again in five billion identical transfers or slightly identical transfers, all of which sound equally crappy and they can compare single, single, little, tiny crackles and snaps and pops and talk amongst themselves. And trust me, you don't want to hang out with those people. You really don't. It's just, it's just awful. But there are three well-filled CDs in this set, and we're going to talk about the performances. The issue with historical recordings, from my point of view, as a critic, and this is something I think um, it's worth it's worth discussing, just so you understand what the issue is. It's twofold. Number one, the first issue is there are practically no historical recordings, and this is a fact which are better, objectively better, and I don't mean technically, I mean interpretively better than anything that came along later in really good sound. And I'm talking about from the 78 era. My definition of really good sound begins, let's say, in the late 40s and early 50s with decent mono, with tape recording that can be remastered and fixed and stuck on CDs and made to sound reasonably like what a performance of the music really ought to sound like. That is, you can hear everything. Large orchestral sections aren't missing. The dynamics aren't so compressed that you have no sense of what the conductor was actually doing with them. Things like that. I mean, I want to know, I want to be able to hear what the performers do. And of course, this is the the judgment as to where acceptable sound begins varies considerably because some early recordings, some some electrical recordings sound really, really good from the 78 era. They really do. And of course, if you're dealing with chamber music or piano music or something, you may, or even vocal music where you're only listening for the voice and don't care about anything else, you may, you may backdate your starting point quite a bit. So you can't generalize, but I'm talking about orchestral music. And orchestral music, of course, poses a particular problem because you need to be able to have a certain technical quality in order to be able to tell what an orchestra is doing generally. Otherwise, it's impossible to tell what is a technical deficiency of the recording and what is an interpretive deficiency of the performance. So that's one issue. But the, but the, the real thing that the historical cultists have a nervous breakdown about is when I say there is no historical orchestral recording that hasn't been better done um, in good sound. But I think that's true. I think it's a fact. You who have seen these videos have seen me make lists of dozens of recordings of basic repertoire pieces that are absolutely splendid. And while you may have a personal preference for an earlier recording or for a favorite artist or something, you know, captured in dim, awful sound, whether it's a, whether it's a live air check pirate thing or whether it's an actual studio or commercial recording made earlier, you can't deny that there are 
any one of number or dozens of superb performances, both technically and interpretively, of the music in question. What your favorite is is irrelevant. It's truly irrelevant. I mean, in terms of considering the general the general parameters of what's available. So that's one fact that you have to deal with. That none of these historical recordings are going to be objectively or in any sense better than what you can get later and in better sound. So that's that's one issue. The other issue is the argument of just how important historical recordings are. As, as documents, uh, what are they? They could be documents of particular performers, of particular, a, a particular era in, in performance, of performance practice uh, of earlier times, there, there are all kinds of reasons that we may want to listen to historical recordings, valid reasons, interesting reasons, really good reasons, legitimate reasons that have very little to do with the ultimate quality of the musical results. This is the idea that, I mean, a historical recording is a document, but the, but the argument for the validity and the ongoing validity of historical recordings is in a sense a generic one. Because when you boil it down to its essence, what you're really saying is that every performance is valuable to the extent that it differs from every other performance, period. And all that matters is the differences. And there will always be differences. Therefore, every performance is as important or valid as any other performance. Now, yes, you can take that point of view. And I do think that from a a purely scholarly or aesthetic point of view, you could say that. I mean, it's not it's not an illegitimate thing to say. It's not a very helpful thing to say um, when you, as a collector, are looking for the best performances of a favorite work. But if you are an incredible fan of Erich, oh, he's sideways, he's upside down, he's right side up, of Erich Kleiber, then you're going to want to get everything he did. And you're not going to care whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And you may think that because he was such an interesting interpreter, generally, everything he did had a certain interest, even the stuff that didn't go too well. Um, again, I, I don't agree with that point of view, but it's a legitimate point of view. And I understand that there are people out there who have it. But my job, as I see it as a critic, is simply to tell you what the best performances of the work in question are. It's not for me to say that Eric Kleiber is important because he was Eric Kleiber. Eric Kleiber was important because he was a great artist and the best work he did is the best work he did. And there's a certain hypocrisy that always, always underpins the everything artist X did is important because those very same people will be the first ones to tell you what their best work is. And then having identified their best work, they really have no basis to tell you you should be listening to their less than best work. <laughs> you really shouldn't. So see, these are some of the, the issues that I deal with as a critic. And when I'm talking to you, I know some of you who are listening love historical recordings. Some of you will be Kleiber fans. Some of you will be new to classical music. You'll be novice listeners and you won't understand you know, what all the folderol is about and all the, the brouhaha about historical recordings. And I want to speak particularly just for a moment to novice listeners, to people who, who don't have massive record collections or are just coming to classical music or getting back to it. Do not, and I mean this, do not believe anybody who tells you you need to listen to a historical recording in preference to a modern recording, particularly if you don't know the work in question. You must hear and learn the music first. And once you know the music, then you'll be ready to interpret it. And by the way, that's the same thing. It's true of performers in general. <clears throat> it really is. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter who the performer is. Before you know what they do with something, you have to know what it is, what they're, what, what, what the composer wanted, what a really great sounding one sounds like. You should hear it live. You should know what it is because that's the only way that you can form a, a, a legitimate judgment. I come across this problem all the time. I run into people who say, oh, I have to hear Fort Fengler's Nazi Ninth from 1942 because it's so extraordinary, blah, 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 for historical circumstances. Never mind that the historical circumstances may have been fascinating. It's a terrible performance of Beethoven's Ninth. Objectively, the sound is crappy. The playing is horrible. You can give credit 
for the for all the horrible noises and sounds as, as an interpretation to the conductor if you want. But you know, everybody knows it didn't sound anything like that on the day. It just didn't. It couldn't have. Whether or not you're right to love the way it come down to us in that sound is a whole other question. But the way it's come down to it is only the vaguest approximation of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And my job is to get people to listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And I'm not wearing a tie for that because that performance is so dreadful. It doesn't require a tie. I don't wear ties for Nazis, period. But it, 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 there's also another story that's just wonderful. And before I get to the performances, and this is the end of it for me, um, and I'll be done with the blather part of this talk. Maria Callas in her master classes. I mean, Maria Callas was the poster child of the conflict between artistic truth and beauty. Her voice was difficult and she struggled with it her whole career. And nobody was more than willing to make an ugly sound for the sake of what she might consider dramatic truth under stress or a death scene. She might utter just an appalling screech. But nobody also was more concerned with trying to make a beautiful sound at all times. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. She is the paradox at the heart of this whole conundrum. She really is. And when she was giving a master class, one of the one of the singers who she was who she was coaching unearthed an absolutely appalling shriek on a high note, and Kala stopped her and said, "What was that?" And she said, "It's a cry of despair." And Kala looked at her and said, "It's not a cry of despair. It's a B flat." <laughs> and that is a lesson. That is a lesson. We need to know it's a B flat before we know it's a cry of despair. And the reality of the situation is there should be no inherent paradox or conflict between making a gorgeous B flat, a fabulously expressive cry of despair. Ideally, you should always do both, always. And one thing does not preclude the other. Performance is not a zero-sum game. And with that, I want to talk about now these performances. First of all, the transfers. Oh, in historical recordings, you always have to talk about the transfers. These transfers were done by Mark Obert Thorne. And Mark Obert Thorne is one of the great 78 restoration guys in the business. And he's done an extremely careful and loving and thorough job. Really, he has. Every transfer person is limited by the quality of the source material that they have. That's always going to be an issue. And then, of course, what we get is Mark Obert Thorne's taste in what this stuff should sound like as regards balance and equalization and noise suppression. And, and all of those things are a subjective judgment. So what we're getting is not the authentic natural sound of Eric Kleiber. What we're getting is the authentic natural sound of Eric Kleiber as filtered through the technological wizardry of Mark Obert Thorne. And I am more than willing to go with his taste in that respect. He is a, a not terribly interventionist and extremely sophisticated and, and very careful restoration master. So that we can all agree on. I'm sure there are very few people who will disagree with that, unless, of course, there are other restoration people who have an axe to grind. So you're going to get, you know, um, some of the best possible sound that you can get in this material. And it's limited. We have to know that. And we're going to talk now about what's on the various discs and just how good the performances are. Some of them are very good indeed. Some of them are... Now, all of these performances are with the Staatskapelle Berlin, which at the time was sometimes called in English the Berlin State Opera Orchestra, which was terribly unhelpful, as the notes point out here, because it was the Staatskapelle Berlin, which is, you know, the orchestra Daniel Barenboim has now, Berlin's second orchestra, and a very, very fine orchestra. But of course, in the 1920s, especially in Germany, especially during, you know, hyperinflation, the end of the First World War, it was a wonderful time for making records. Apparently, they were making records all over the place. But were the orchestras really great? Were they up to modern standards? No, none of them were. Not the Berlin Philharmonic, none of them. They could deliver fantastic results on specific occasions. But on the whole, uh, they sound quite seedy in places. But in any case... 
And Kleiber, of course, is known as a disciplinarian, as somebody who wanted extremely, extremely precise and and clean results in all of his performances. And so that's something people listen for in his performances, and they are present here intermittently. We begin with the Overture to Idomeneo by Mozart, and it's quite lovely. And I have to say, um, this is from, what, 1928, and it sounds surprisingly good. It really does. Uh, uh, there's either a very good source or it was a good recording to begin with, but it sounds really, really good. Then there are some Mozart German dances with the Staatskapelle Berlin, including the sleigh ride, the sleigh ride, which is really a rough and ready sleigh ride. And I don't mean that in a in a hostile sense. That is that the performance is crude, but it's vigorous. I mean, these German dances are not your dainty little Mozart. They are passionate, vigorous Mozarts. They're fun to hear. Yeah, I mean, he really, Kleiber really makes something of these things. And there's a bunch, another set of them with the Berlin Philharmonic. Then we get Beethoven's Second Symphony. Now, now the notes here describe how Mr. Obert Thorne uh, had to replace a missing chord in the first movement of the Second Symphony and try and add back analogous passages that dropped out or were screwed up in the scherzo. And generally speaking, he's done a very sensitive job. But it also tells you, again, just how much electronic processing was necessary in order to realize these performances. And of course, the more processing you do, the less close you are to what the artists themselves actually did. And so we need to be clear that when people tell you that historical recordings are somehow, you know, there's something exciting about them because they couldn't do retakes and they you had to live with what the result was. We're not happy with what the result was. And if we're not happy with it, we try to fix it. We really do. So so unless you've got the 78 yourself and you're playing them on your own Victrola or whatever the heck, you know, your 78 thing was with a number five darning needle, then then don't don't be hypocritical. All of these things are going to be be spruced up to the extent we possibly can. And that will necessarily come between us and what actually happened on the day. So the second symphony has its moments. It's a good performance, a solid performance, but the finale is terribly heavy, just heavy and sluggish. And I, it surprises me, it really does. But this is a problem that these performances seem to have during this little three-year period in Kleiber's career, which is a certain plodding rigidity that's going to come back to haunt us on a few occasions. Then we get a couple bits of Schubert uh, Rosamunda incidental music, which are very attractive, and the Schubert Unfinished Symphony. Now, the first movement is much better than the second movement in this unfinished. And again, the Andante, I, I get the sense, I get the sense, it's with the Berlin Philharmonic, I get the sense that if we had been there on the day, or if we could hear what it really sounded like, it would have been a very lovely performance of the Andante. But the fact of the matter is that, again, there's a certain certain rhythmic rigidity to the performance. There's no other way of saying it. The pizzicatos on them just going plonk, plonk, plonk. And I think it may be just because there, there's a certain lack of richness to the sound and a certain dynamic subtlety that's absent that would have carried us through the, the deliberateness of the tempo and the certain squareness in phrasing. But as it is, it just sounds dull. It sounds dull and heavy. And that surprised me. It really did. Then we get three bits of A Midsummer Night's Dream by Mendelssohn, the scherzo, which is not the most disciplined scherzo, even though it's not at the quickest tempo. But you can hear the orchestra struggling. It's the Berlin Philharmonic again. Um, and then the Nocturne, which is fine, and the Wedding March, which sounds really good, except you don't hear things like cymbals and whatnot. I mean, percussion instruments, if they use them at all, which I pretty sure they didn't sometimes just I mean the mics never captured them you couldn't get the overtones you couldn't get you couldn't get the crash of a symbol in, in this last work here on um, the last work here is no it's not it's on the next one so we'll do that on the, the William Tell Overture which is it's a good William Tell Overture by the way it's exciting and it's fun and the final gallop is really good but you know there isn't any cymbal player you hear a triangle somewhere in the distance you know but the violins are nice and crisp 
and and the orchestra seems to be having a very very good time and especially in the cellos at the beginning of the overture and this was recorded in 1927 you can hear them just vibrating away to their heart's content once again making nonsense of the historically informed people's contention that uh string players didn't use vibrato until later like around World War II, it's such hogwash. Anyway, it's a fun William Tell Overture, followed by an equally fun Berlioz Roman Carnival, where you do hear cymbals. You see, they sort of sound like you know pot lids getting banged together. You go, Ksh! you know, but there's 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 no there's no higher overtones or swoosh, you know, to the tone. It's very funny to listen to, and the tambourine forget, but it's an exciting performance. I'm a rollicking performance that I enjoyed. And finally, we get Nikolai's The Merry Wives of Windsor. Now, Kleiber was, at this point, a very serious opera conductor. I mean, that's what he did. Remember, he did the premiere of Wozzeck. The reason he left Germany was because the Nazis wouldn't let him perform Lulu. He was, he was a, a wonderful theater guy. And so all of his theatrical overtures in this set, and there are a couple are really, really worth hearing, especially disc three, the beginning deflator mouse overture, a fun performance, flowing and ebullient and lovely. And wait till you hear the bell clank, clank. When you hear no overtones, you realize that without them, all bells sound out of tune as this one really does. It's very, very funny. Then we have two recordings of Mav Lost, one from 1927 and a remake from 1928. Now, again, Kleiber's, the quiet parts, when you don't have to hear like a lot of noise, um, the performance is, is, has exquisite moments. You can really hear Kleiber phrase the opening melody and the, the little tenuti over the melody, you know, do 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 ya da da. I mean, he just touches those details in beautifully. And you hear the triangle, it's amazing. But uh, seriously, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful opening. And you know that all of that soulfulness and phrasing and all the beautiful things when people talk about stuff, usually it's bullshit. You know, ah, oh, the phrasing. Well, here you can tell the phrasing is great. But when you get toward the end, when you get to the climax and all kinds of stuff's happening, it's a mess. Just a mess. The 1927 recording, which sounds better than the remake. And again, I don't know if it sounded better because because um, it's, it's a rarity. And so the source that Mark Oberthorn had was just in better shape than the later one that he had, which was worn out a little. I don't know. All I can tell you is that when you get to the big climax at the end, it's just a just a muddle. I don't know whether the trumpets are playing or they're not playing or I mean if you hear the only the violins going going you know they're doing river things. You hear them doing river river stuff. And the second version goes better. Dimly through the murk, you can hear that the full orchestra is kind of on top of it. Um, so that's probably why that was the preferred version over 1927. But still, it's it's just, it starts out so beautifully and evocatively, and then it just becomes less and less listenable as it goes on. Now, after that, we get the New World Symphony. Now, the New World Symphony was a Kleiber specialty, sort of, kind of. He does a very, very good New World Symphony. He really does. It's a good, solid performance by any standard. Is it one of the great performances of the New World Symphony? No. Is it important for its date? Maybe. But as record collectors now, I don't really care whether it was important for its date. I leave it to historians to talk about the celebrated, incredibly important for its date, Kleiber New World Symphony. I really only care about what the best versions are that you have the opportunity to listen to. So again, it's, it's a fine performance. Is nothing to be ashamed of. And interestingly enough, you get an extra take of the second half of the scherzo, which pops up about midway into the trio or at the beginning of the trio. I think sort of the beginning of the trio. And and the remake, this is very interesting. The remake is the one that Obert Thorne includes in the performance of the whole symphony, is more flowing, more natural sounding, 
less stiff, less rigid, which gives you a sense that perhaps Kleiber was aware of where his defects were. And it's only, uh, it was a function of, of time and, and money and other factors that he wasn't able to address those issues in the other performances on this disc. It really is, it really is fascinating to hear, to hear that little bit of the scherzo twice because, I mean, also the woodwinds are just, oh, what a mess, and their trills and things, there's just strange things happening. I also wonder at the opening of the scherzo if there, if Kleiber didn't like eliminate the violin parts, because what you hear is, is bum ba dum bum dum ba dum bum not yum ba dum bum yum ba dum bum you know, the way you normally hear it. Mm-mm-mm. I don't know whether the high frequencies are getting cut off or he just rescored it, or he wanted it to sound less like the scherzo in Beethoven's Ninth, so he rewrote what Dvorak did. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a good new world. It really is a good new world. And it ends with an absolutely horrendous, wretched, appalling, atrocious, disgusting Slavonic dance number one. Just terrible Slavonic dance number one. It's fast. It's really fast and really ragged and just terrible. Absolutely terrible. And of course, you don't hear half of it anyway. And oh, God, it's awful. And that is the complete Eric <laughs> Kleiber on Polydor, which became Deutsche Grammophon, the 78s. Some good, some bad, some interesting, some not interesting. None of it is essential in any of the works presented, except possibly the Mozart German dances, maybe the Fledermaus Overture, a couple things that really I think are kind of special. But by the same token, if you like this artist, if you think he's important, then you may want to hear this. If you're curious about how German orchestras sounded in the 1920s in probably some of the better technology that they had in the day, this is worth hearing. I can't dispute the fact that it has been beautifully put together. The notes in the booklet are excellent. I think they're by by Alan. Who are they by? Uh, Wait a minute. Let me just make sure I got that. Got this right. There's an excellent note here by, let's give him credit, Alan Sanders, who is you know, a long, long time music enthusiast and, and Deutsche Grammophon guy who I happen to know and who really knows his stuff. He's written a beautiful booklet note and, and Mark Obert Thorne has contributed a very intelligent and honest um, discussion of the recordings and how he's had to treat them. So it's a beautiful production, excellently well done. But like I said, it's a mixed bag musically and, and um, you're a collector. You may be a collector. Uh, you may want it for that reason. If you are a novice, go elsewhere. I think that's a fair recommendation. I really do. Do not listen to the screaming of historical recording enthusiasts who insist that this is the only way to go. Learn the music first, listen to the music, find the performances that speak to you best, then try this out. See what's there and what's missing and whether or not the approach, the the nature of historical recording and the process, its limitations and its and it's its advantages in the sense of a certain possible, you know, spontaneity and naturalness. I don't know. I don't believe that, but proponents of this thing do. See if that speaks to you. But first, keep on listening to the music itself. Thank you, folks. Take care. And thank you for joining me.